because that's a very uh, consistent theme these days of who we are, what we should be, and how should we get there. And it's very appropriate because, as we know, we have been talking about the fact that we know that the Lord's return is, is close. And everything that we see in the world is preparing um, the nations, is preparing the people, is preparing us to his return. So this evening, we will look at three things. We will look at the principles of belonging. What does it mean to belong to someone or something? We will look at the principles of the natural. And we will look at the principles of the spiritual. So the natural man uh, and the spiritual man is a, comp is a concept that we find throughout scripture. God, God has a specific character in mind that is his. And he has shown us his character. And he has sent his son to show us his character. And his son showed us his character by living his character. So Paul uses three distinct terms <clears throat> towards this regard. <clears throat> there are those who are Christian and spiritual. There are those who are Christian but carnal or fleshly. There are those who are not Christian at all, <clears throat> whom Paul calls natural, or the natural man. <coughs> Excuse me. I started this about 15 minutes ago. So the principles of belonging. Belonging to Christ means being related to him. Paul describes his relationship with Christ in the following verse, Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we all know these verses in the sense that <clears throat> when we say that we were buried in baptism, buried and raised, similar to putting man to death and being raised out of the waters of baptism, a new man, we put on Christ. We live as Christ. And this is what Paul is telling us. <clears throat> Belonging to Christ means being related to him, as we saw before, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Ye are bought with a price, but not ye the servants, or be ye not the servants of men. So being bought by someone, <clears throat> um, which still exists today, by the way, in some countries, but being bought by someone meant that you were now their servant, their slave. And you could do whatever they demand you to do. And, and that was a fact of life. And this is the principle that scripture has given us, again, from the very beginning, but especially in the New Testament when the Lord came and through the words of Paul and Peter and the other apostles, that we are now servants or slaves or bond servants to our Lord Jesus Christ. And our challenge, I guess, in our lives is that we do not make ourselves bond servants to our world, to our work, to the flesh. So, the spiritual man belonging to Christ means following Jesus. There are several ways the Bible describes this relationship between Christ and his people. Jesus Christ is the king of his people who make up his kingdom. The husband of his people 
who are his bride. He is the shepherd of his people who are his sheep and the head of his people who form his body. So this is what belonging or being owned by, and that was, that was a very common theme in, in practice and still is today in the countries of dictatorships, that you belong to the dictator or the king, and you basically have do not have rights. And we know as in, in, the, in the Western world, that technically this is what everybody is focusing on these days, and that is our rights. Belonging to the king, how did, what did that entail? All these relationships share a central idea. Each one implies that we follow the instructions and authority of Christ our king, our master and our Lord, or the king. So citizens of the kingdom are under the rule of the king. The rule, the dictatorship. A wife is subject to her husband. Sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd. The body takes instruction from the head. Those are all principles based on one head. Belonging to Christ means following him just like we would follow a king, just like the sheep would follow the shepherd, just like the feet would follow the head's command to go forward. They listen to him, they obey or hearing. That word obeying in scripture is hearing. For example, in 1 Samuel uh, 15 or 16 or 15, when Samuel said this to Saul after he had offered that place, it is not better to obey than to sacrifice. This is what the Lord wants. And that word obey there is the word hearing. It is better to hear, to listen, than to sacrifice. So we look at now this, the um, principles of the natural man. So the Bible speaks of the natural man as the person who has not received Christ as his savior or in the Old Testament, God as his savior. And we all know all the stories when Israel was taken out of Egypt. They became God's firstborn. They were gods. They belonged to God. And Moses kept reminding them of that. But over and over again, they kept fighting that. But the natural man in 1 Corinthians 2 says, man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. The natural man says, that's nonsense. Nor can he, he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You have to be spiritually minded to get it. And we know that Jesus used that term over and over again. When they asked, uh, one example is when this uh, apostle asked him, what do you speak to people in, in parables? He said, so that they hear, but they don't understand. They see, but they don't understand. So this is why they would have to search it out. But most people, don't want to be bothered. It's work. God says a natural man has a spiritual blindfold in 2 Corinthians. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So there are some people that God does not need. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. <clears throat> the natural man operates on human wisdom. That's the basis. That's their springboard. That's the foundation of all their thinking. From the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night, they operate on human wisdom. 
And they say, the wisdom of God is, is, is nonsense. It doesn't work for us. He's not made a commitment to Christ. In order to change that mindset, there has to be a commitment. And we'll look at that in, in a little later on when we look at the uh, spiritual side. Will not experience the new birth. They have not experienced it. And they are not willing to. And they won't go through the steps to. Because every day, the human wisdom, they find wisdom in it, and they find experiences and new births in that. That's what they seek for. Everything they do, everything they think about is for that little bit of a new birth, a growth for themselves. It does, they do not have the spirit of God living in them. They do not understand or welcome spiritual truths. It's foolish, foolishness to them. There's no real understanding of the Bible, nor want to understand the Bible, because they have their own instruction manuals. They do not receive or welcome the message of scripture. The reaction to the message of the gospel is that it is foolishness, it's ridiculous, it's outdated, it's simple, it's childish. And some of these things, we have to be careful that we do not start looking at things in this light. Well, that's outdated. Well, that, that's too simple. Well, that, that's ridiculous. That's what it means. The summary of the natural man is, while worldly, often describes individuals who are sophisticated and well-rounded in education, travel, experiences. It's also used for people who are rooted in the world or focused on physical and material things around them rather than on spiritual matters. That is their life. So now if we move to the spiritual, so from natural to spiritual, the only way is through Christ. In Ephesians 2, we read, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So there's that purchase. There's that belonging aspect that we looked at. For he is our peace. So through him, if we understand that, there is hope. We can take a deep breath and go forward. Who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us, between us and God, and between us and him. Because by doing that, we indeed can put on the king. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the enemy, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself appoint one new man, so making peace. The new man is in peace. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. This is dead to the man, dead to the natural man which we read this evening in Colossians 3, dead to impurity, passions, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. All those are idolaters. For it is because of these things, it's those things that create the wrath of God on us. It will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So what does that mean for us? It means that that is the challenge that we are faced with. That's the border. Either we cross it back to it or we remain out of it. And we'll look at a schematic visualizing that a little later on. But Colossians, Begins with that we read this evening, 
if indeed you have put off the old man, he says, live as if you're sitting on the right hand of God. This is how he sees it. If you then be risen with Christ in verse one, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So basically he's saying, seek those things as if you're sitting on the right hand of God. He says, set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Do not look at the border. Do not see on the other side, look on the other side of the fence. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, and in the King James, it says, who is our life? But remove that. It says, when Christ, our life. That's what he's saying. That's what was originally said. When Christ, our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Because he was our life. Because we belong to him. And we had put away the world and we didn't go back to the world. He says, therefore, kill or mortify your members which are upon the earth. And we just looked at that. This is what he was saying. If you, indeed you have put out, you belong to me, be with me, even at the right hand of God. So if we are that, we need to walk as that. And it's a war, it's a battle. Day in, day out, every moment of every day. A war in the mind and heart of every Christ follower. That's our battle. That's our war. That's our walk. It's a war, a war for control. To whom do we give control? To whom should we give control? And it is to Christ. It is to God. He has told us. You can't change anything of your stature, for example. I am what I am, physically. I can't change it. Paul writes, but I say, walk in the spirit. And you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you walk it, you won't go the other way. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. If you allow it in, it will challenge you. Remember Cain. God said, sin lies at the door. You keep that door closed. But if you open the door, guess what? You're creating challenges for yourself. You're creating the problem. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit. That's its whole purpose. And the spirit against the flesh. That's its whole purpose. Genesis 3.15, the, the seed of the woman and versus the seed of the serpent, the springboard, the foundation for all scripture. So for 6,000 years, God has been using that process to give his people that he wants the opportunity to be with him. One of the parables Again, the parables of the talents. That's what this is about. And that's why Jesus used it. So that you may not do the things that you please. See the key words? It's a not about us. We gave us, we, we killed ourselves. For those of us who have gone through the waters of baptism, we're dead. And we'll talk about and uh, shortly about those who are not yet baptized. The spiritual man, the call, what's the call? Deny yourself, deny the flesh, to die daily. Repeat that baptismal gesture, day in, day out, to crucify the flesh. To, to mortify it, kill it. The spirit and the flesh are at war. It's a battle that will never end until either we fall asleep or the Lord returns.
It's set in stone. Jesus lived it. Jesus showed us. That's the only way. We can't go say, oh, in my case, it's different. Doesn't work that way. There's only one way. The battle is less what I do and more what I want to do. I am passionate for what I love, for what I long for. So what are we passionate for? What do we long for? If it is of the world, that's what it will be. So Jesus has reminded us all of the apostles, all of the gospels and the epistles remind us that it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's spiritual and we have to long for it. We have to be passionate for it and we have to live for it. By walking in the spirit or by the spirit or according to the spirit, when we are filled with the spirit, that's the only way. We will then manifest the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In what we read tonight in Colossians, for example, in verse, uh, starting in verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God. That's a key word, isn't it? The elect of God. Holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Verse 13, forbearing one another. See, what's interesting is, and forbearing is to put up with. We cannot put up with unless we have verse 12 under our belts. Unless we have these attributes, we cannot put up with somebody. And forgive, we cannot forgive one another if we don't have, if we haven't worked on, if we're not establishing in our very self these attributes of verse 12. The rest, if we don't have those, we will not be able to master the other one or to make them work. Yes, sometimes we will fail. We will trip, but the idea is to get back up and get moving again. <clears throat> so the battle is less what I do and more what I want to do, right? So I want to be in the kingdom. I want to be a servant of the Lord. I want to belong. If that's what I want, then I will be passionate for it. I will love it and I will long for it. It's the mind and not the rules. Over in scripture, it's what we think, how we think. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. This truth is emphasized when we realize that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. So unless we have that mindset, it is very difficult to continue on the right light in the right spirit. True worship is not a matter of location or activity. It is an outpouring of the inner man. We all know the verse in Isaiah where it says, and the servant breathe in the word of God. And the, if you breathe in, you have to breathe out. So if you breathe in the word of God, you will breathe out the word of God. And this is what Jesus did. He breathed in the word of God, literally, every day, all day long. Then he was able to breathe it out to anybody he spoke to. The Apostle Paul says that living sacrificially and holy with a renewed mind in our spirit, spiritual worship. This is what he reminds us in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. That this is what we need to live with. How we need to live. It's the mind, not the rules. Paul is not addressing the behaviors when he speaks of spiritual versus carnal. He is speaking of our minds. It's our mindset. Romans 8, verses 5 to 8. For those who live according to the flesh, 
set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those are the things that are in the mind. So if it's on the mind, it will happen. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. So our minds need to be filled. Jesus used the parable of cleaning the house. And if we don't refill it with spiritual things, the old man will come back and he'll bring some friends with him. And it'll be seven times worse than what it was before. So to set the mind on the right path, the mind will take care of the feet. Because the mind is the brain, is the heart. It drives the rest of the body. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. That's what we are hoping for. That's the, the star, if you will, at the end. That's the goal. That's the hope. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Again, Genesis 3.15, the mindset of the seed of the serpent versus the mindset of the seed of the woman, our Lord, our King, our Master. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. If we live by the flesh, it will not give in to God because it does not want to get rid of the control. It wants the control. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. Oh, uh, he's so spiritual. Oh, she's so spiritual. What does it mean to say someone is spiritual? Well, in society's mind, you'll often hear answers like, a spiritual person is one who practices yoga faithfully. That's, they're in peace. They're very, very spiritual. Who meditate daily. One who cares for people. Is kind to animals. Who recycles everything. One who can work the tarot cards. One who is one with the universal gods. Mother Nature, one who attends church regularly, has a daily prayer discipline, who knows their Bible well. First Corinthians 14, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So to be spiritually minded is to hear the commandments of the Lord, the commandments of Christ, and produces the fruit of the Spirit automatically. It will happen. And the fruit of the Spirit, as we saw earlier, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, and faith, they will occur. And 1 Corinthians uh, 13, for example, back to the previous uh, Previous verse, what does it make a person spiritual? He says, you can have all of these things. Everything. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. So love allows you, as we read in these, love is these attributes here. Because you're changing yourself. Your mind will allow to forbear. will allow to live according to the Lord Jesus. Even as they were killing him. Forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. Incredible mindset. Incredible love for his God. So it's at that point that we have to strive to be to that level because as we read earlier in, this, in Colossians 3, when Christ, our life, shall appear. If he's not our life, when he appears, he's going to say, where's Ray? Where is he? 
Oh, I guess he's living his life. He's busy, busy, busy his life. Even if we're busy at life, we have to be busier at this life, at being Christ, sitting on the right hand of God. Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Our all purpose is to put away the old man and become what our Lord showed us to be, a lamb. He came as a lamb and he will return as a lion. That's our challenge. Put away the old so it becomes part of us so that we overcome it more and more. It's in us, but it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's that mindset again. It's the mind. It's not the body. We can't change the body. It's the mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not my will, but thine be done, was Jesus' prayer as he was about to be killed. That's our challenge. In John 3, verse 8, in the ESV, it writes, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, the slanderer, allowing the slandering. And the more we allow it, the more the old man replaces the new. It's becoming stronger. It's becoming bigger than we want it to be. And we say, oh, we can manage it. No, you can't. We've all experienced it. The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the slanderer. The work that was done way back in Genesis 3, verses 1 to 4. 1 to 3. That's the slandering thought process. Now you won't die. Go ahead. Live your life. You're going to be like one of them, like God's. Go ahead. Live your life. The more we allow it, the more it will win. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born, again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot. But the more that we work on the new man, the smaller and smaller the, the, the natural man will become. At some point, it will still be in us, but hardly visible. We won't have, the battles will be a lot less. The war will have been won. Now we'll just be dealing with small battles. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's our challenge. And the more we do that, the smaller the old man will be. And the more our life will become Christ's. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. That's our battle. That's the only war we have on every day of our lives. <clears throat> so we said we would look at couple of things pertaining to our walk. So the natural man, who were some of them? Well, we all know them. Adam, he was not deceived, however. The woman was utterly deceived, but he was held accountable. Nimrod was in God's face. Cain did it after his, his way. Esau, we all know 
that he lived according to the flesh. What are the, the opposing sides? We have Jesus. Jesus' role, his whole role, his complete role was to replace, to relive Adam's role. And he did it the way it should have been done. And he didn't lose anyone. He didn't lose his bride. Except the one who was prophesied to be. Because he needed someone to have him killed. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Saul and David. We all know that these, this side were the Lord Jesus. They typed the Lord Jesus. Thus, we have to be typing the Lord Jesus. Our walk is not a straight line. But what's our purpose? To become refined gold. So that when the time comes, we are at the right place at the right time. Does this begin, does this challenge, this war, this progression start at baptism? No, it doesn't. That's where it starts. When we're children, mom and dad's role comes in. They have to be examples. They have to be setting the rules, the boundaries. They have to set the standards for these young children. They have to give them God's word. They have to be the influencers, provide them with the proper influencers in their lives. They have to provide the discipline. Unless there is those basic foundations, it's going to be very difficult. And one of the most important one, the fear of God. Because without fear of the King, of the Creator, of His Son, our Lord, without the proper amount of fear, it's very difficult. And the child will already begin to form, to work towards having, being gold. Because at baptism, what makes it happen? It's a decision. And to make that decision, you have to be already belonging to something, which is Christ. That decision is, it's time. So it doesn't begin here. It begins here. And if you're a, somebody who comes to the truth over here, it's the same thing. And what we read earlier in Colossians, if... We have put out the old at that point. We have to live as if we're up here already. And Jesus said it. The kingdom is in you. So we have the mind of Christ on our, on our travel. And that's the only way we're going to get there. Now, there are influencers, peer pressure, day in, day out, work pressure, personal pressure, lack of fear. Self-confidence, those are all things that can affect negatively our walk. And if we consider these, we know some of the modern ones. It's very easy to live two lives, two lives. Living the natural, nine to five. Five o'clock, oh, time for the spiritual. Or look at these contrasts. We all know these guys, these stories. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dr. Banner and the Hulk. This is what the old and the new is about. That's our battle all the time. Looking at it in a different way, this transformation process. 
Saul became Paul. He had to go through it. Galatians 5, this is, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we've looked at these verses. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other. They are enemies. It is a war. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Romans 6, knowing this, that a old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So the old man is dead. And we need to keep it dead. That's our challenge, isn't it? Ephesians 4, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That's our challenge. Colossians 3 that we read earlier, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man. And we know that in Revelation, this is extremely important. What does he say about liars? And have put on the new man, the new, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our image. Because he was the very image of the Lord God, as in first Colos in Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image and likeness of God. So, having now become Paul, the living has to occur. Galatians 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by it. First Peter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Pride will not allow us to put away the old man. Humility will. We need to memorize chapter 5, verses five to ten, uh, 1 to 10. It's all about the new man. And what will that, the output of that? It's the kingdom. We will be with God. That's the only way. So do we, we belong to Christ or the world. We know that this day is coming, brothers and sisters and young people. This day is coming. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Our Lord first came as a lamb. He is coming back as a lion. Brothers and sisters, look at the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Lord is understanding. Brothers and sisters, we will have to account. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's our job. That's our role. And if we are Christ now, our role is to relive Genesis 3. The right way. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. And we know that the last individual he spoke to had not done that. He could not tell him that he had done right because he did not do right. He did it according to the flesh. Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In closing, 
Brothers and sisters, in summary, what is the, the old, what, what's involved? What are the characteristics? What are the types of people? There are those who are Christ and spiritual. There are those who are Christ, but carnal and fleshly. There are those who are not Christ at all, whom Paul calls natural, the natural man. Thank you.